Right, where were we? Welcome to chapter 12. Chapter 12, in which we get a significant amount of content taking place. This is the favorite area of quantitative, statistically oriented market researchers, marketing academics, customer satisfaction, service quality. This is a big, big business. So there is an appendix to this chapter and that appendix is really there for you if you are keen to get into the quantitative or the evasive end of service quality. And look, there's a good business to be had there. So in all seriousness, if you're good with the numbers, you like a bit of market research, give the chapter appendix a look over. If you're big on qual, there's a lot of work to be done in service quality in terms of qualitative analysis, but this chapter leans towards the quant. So quite seriously, this is the heavy end of the hammer. This is one of the big chapters in terms of concepts, content, and it would be on the tail end of semester, so my apologies for that. That's a little bit, timing's not as best as it could be, but let's have a look. So, customer satisfaction. I'm going to overlook the irony of the student evaluations of learning and teaching being available around the point in time we talk about customer satisfaction and customer client complaining behavior. What satisfaction consists of is a subjective, personal, post-purchase evaluation of the whole service experience. Now the key things to remember, it is subjective. There is no objectivity in satisfaction. You can produce your service to your service goals, to your KPIs, to your service scripts, and have an unhappy, dissatisfied customer. So the post-purchase evaluation is around the processes, around the people, and around the outcome. Did the service deliver what was expected or better in terms of the procedures? Were the people, was the interaction with the people, were the people who delivered the service engaging with the customer in a way the customer found satisfactory or the customer liked or enjoyed outcome. This is one, this is usually ranked as the most important factor. Did the service do what it promised to do? Did the customer get the service experience they desired? So it's a combination of the emotional state of the customer and the trade-off between what they expected and what they currently perceive. So the question you're asking yourself here in terms of the customer's views, were the basics covered? Did the service exceed expectation? Was it better than you were anticipating? Did it meet the minimums you were anticipating? And this is where we get these concepts of zone of tolerance, zone of apathy, and this whole idea of there is a maths of satisfaction. And satisfaction can be mathematically brought down to a measure of expectation and a score for expectation and a measure of perceived service quality and a score and then you can do the math satisfaction equals expectation minus perception if your expectation has been exceeded it is a good quality and you have satisfaction if your perceptions uh, if your expectation has not been exceeded, so you are dissatisfied with the service as you perceived it, you are unhappy. So from the point of view of a marketer, why bother with satisfaction? And this is a serious question to consider. Again, customer satisfaction is contextual. Do you need to satisfy the customer if the customer has limited choice low competition, and you have some form of geographic exclusivity. Now, the reasons in favor of customer satisfaction and the benefits of satisfaction are basically boiling down to a single idea. It's the money. Repeat patronage, 
loyalty, free publicity, reduces the cost of attracting new customers. A happy customer is worth money because they will buy, they'll buy from you again, they will recommend, and if they're doing the recommendation, they're recruiting on your behalf. The other thing about service quality and service satisfaction is it can build a barrier to prevent customers from being poached by the competition. Happiness is a form of inertia. Satisfaction is inertia. If you are happy with the customer, you're happy with the customer service and satisfied with the service outcomes at the companies you're going to, you're not going to engage such behavior because you're not triggering, you're not having a problem recognition trigger. Finally, on the benefit of satisfaction is when it does go wrong, because it always does, satisfaction buys you a buffer against failure. So if the customer has been satisfied previously, they can go, well, it went wrong this time, but that's only a minor problem against a long history of success or a history of success. Therefore, the cost of this failure is not that great compared to the cost of switching. If you don't satisfy your customer, then switching is a cheaper alternative. All right, figure 12.2. I wanted to bring this one to your attention because nothing screams equation and structural equation model more than this. Four variables into a moderating out to results. There had to have been an equation underpinning this. So if you do dig up the original, you ever get a chance to see the original paper, chances are there is a structural equation in there and a series of maths and surveys and quantitative data. How you use a model like this is important. What you're looking at here is that this is a descriptor of the world. This is what a marketing scientist has gone off and studied. So you can look at this and go, what is important to us as marketers well, satisfaction is driven from price, quality, customer service, chapter 11, and brand, and affinity with the brand. And that becomes a cumulative satisfaction. So all four factors must be in place. So you've got to have all four under control. From cumulative satisfaction, you then look at what are the likely loyal behaviors. The loyalty of continuing to do business. What does that behavior do for you as an organization? Retention lowers churn rate, increases revenue. Loyalty behavior, cumulative satisfaction, driving an increased purchase, buying more of the same. Think back to your ANSOF matrix. Existing customer, existing product, selling more, increased share of business more value per customer. So your third option here on loyalty, so from price, quality, service, and brand, people are satisfied with this brand and they're willing to endorse this brand. They're willing to put a social reputation, stake some of their social reputation on your service being high quality. They also gain, so if they recommend, so if you're running a good service and you're customers recommend this service to others and this product is successful and meets the needs of the customer's friends, the customer gains some of the social capital they gambled on the endorsement. You gain the new customers. All of these things result in money. So kind of the spoiler for this whole chapter is value satisfaction, it's about the money. So what are the components? What matters here? And we're going to see a really basic model of satisfaction in a moment and a not so basic model. But fundamentally it comes down to the perception of service quality, the perception of the performance. And we have a model to measure that and it's called SurfQual. It's quite complicated in terms of it's uh, five items, usually that's six items a piece, run twice, about 60 questions you ask people. But we can measure performance. We can measure service quality. The next element we have is value. 
in your AMA 2007 definition of marketing, marketing's purpose is to create, communicate, deliver, and exchange offerings that have value. Now here we've got three, and the, the chapter's covering three types of value. Social, emotional, and interactional. Social value is the sense of self. I have come to the service, I have bought this service, I have engaged with the service, I feel better about me for this service. Or I have gained a personal experience of an enhanced self-concept, so I'm up there at the top of the Maslow hierarchy of needs up at self-actualization. Emotional value is the experience. It's the subjective, I have an emotional response, perhaps happiness, satisfaction, delight, it's the positive, now again, because we're talking about value here, we're just on the positives. It's the positive feeling from the service. Interactional value is the positive feeling from engaging with the people in the service. Now this can be the interactional value of a positive emotion uh, from talking with people, social dynamic, loyalty, friendships, all of these elements the interactional value costs emotional labor to deliver. The emotional value may also cost emotional labor to deliver. The social value is the rep, comes back to the service flower where we talk about the ego protection needs, where we're looking after a customer, making the customer feel valued. So we've got these, the value connections, we've got component behaviors across the chapters that allow us to target, focus, and augment these value offerings. So again, think about how your wires cross over, how things are linked. The last part of the value satisfaction element is the money. Is the service good value financially? Is it worth the money? So these components lead us to this basic model of service. And the important thing about a basic model like this is that it is a thought process. Customer satisfaction is derived from two factors. Service quality, customer perception of value. But service quality directly impacts on customer satisfaction and indirectly impacts on customer satisfaction by modifying the customer's perceived value of the service. So you can see that there is a weighted difference here. Service quality has a modifier, multiplier effect on perceived value and a direct effect on satisfaction. Customer perceived value goes to behavioral intention. If you feel that this was valuable and the service was worthwhile, you will probably be loyal. If you're satisfied, you will probably be loyal. So this is a basic model. This is a think through the way the world works, a description of how the world exists. The not as basics model is a, it's a the disconfirmation of expectations model. I'd like to thank Paul Patterson for doing what all of us academics do, which is try and always embed one of your own pieces of work in your own book. Partly because you know the work so well, you know where it's gonna fit. So what we've got here is a model of expectation. As I said to you at the, early in this, that perception of performance, so perceived performance and expectation is a maths equation. And what we have here are the possible outcomes from expectation and performance. Now this is where I'm going to flag a little bit of content from later in this chapter block, and that is expectations also are a key part of the service gap model. And expectations are derived from your prior experience with the product, what you've heard, so the word of mouth, what has been said directly by the firm in terms of promises, 
through AMC. And what you know of the competition. And this is one of the tricky ones. Your expectations of a service will be impacted by your knowledge of the product category. The more you know about a category of services, say for instance coffee shops and coffee. You fancy yourself as a bit of a connoisseur, you've been around most of the coffee shops that the city has to offer. Your expectation of what a coffee shop should do, provide and be like is going to be significantly different to someone who only wants has a regular store that they go to once or twice. They've got the one venue, no real knowledge of what else, no real knowledge of what other brands do, so their expectations will be different. So experience within the current service provider, experience and awareness across the product category of the service provider. Those are two facets that will lead into experiences and that will create expectations. Perception and expectation then are put to the comparison and we have the question of does the perception and the expectation exceed, match or it's less than? A negative disconfirmation, your expectations were not met, you will be dissatisfied. A confirmation, now the term mere satisfaction, look, they're satisfied. Confirmation, does what it says on the tin, happy, will buy again. Positive disconfirmation is this notion of delight. Delight is a higher risk proposition than mere satisfaction. The book's a bit big on uh, delight and positive disconfirmation, but that's also, there's, there are some ideological positions in services marketing um, in terms of satisfying, which is confirmation, satisfice, which is actually somewhere between disconfirmation and confirmation. So satisfy is meet the expectation by the performance. Satisfice is meet the critical elements. That means that they'll still use your product, but don't exceed it. And delight, which is exceed it, but then you'll change a delight experience will change the expectations because it will change the customer's experience with your service. So delight's a risky one because you will end up in this cycle of enhancing the customer's expectations and constantly trying to delight means that you are going to hit a point where you cannot beat the expectations because the expectations are no longer reasonable. And it happens. So the influence on satisfaction, a couple of the um, elements here, again, we're looking at positive and negative. So the prior attitudes, what your expectations versus your perceptions, we've talked a bit about that. But the other thing on satisfaction is the attribution. And the text talks about it in terms of attribution of fault. I like to talk about it in terms of success and failure. When the service goes right, so you go off and you go to see a movie, and it's great. It's way above what you're expecting. It's amazing. You're delighted. Where does the success occur? Who's to credit for the success? Where are you going to attribute success? So, oh, it's a great movie. Brilliant film. Or, yeah, I'm a good fan. Control attribution. Was the success or the failure controllable? So if we think about it from a fault perspective, Something goes wrong on a service, is it your fault as customer or is it the provider's fault? Something go, you go to see a movie and you don't like the movie, this movie sucks, or I am the wrong audience. Control attribute, could you have reasonably controlled for and prevented the success? Could you have reasonably controlled for and prevented the failure? If you go, if you are not a fan of musicals or westerns and you go to see a musical about the OK Corral, the fault lies with you, but also that was a completely controllable, avoidable fault. You'd said on the tin, 
Western musical, you don't like Westerns or musicals, control was there. Stability. Will the fault recur? Will the success recur? And these are the satisfaction, the controls on satisfaction of, if I think it's my fault, but I could have controlled for it, and it's unlikely that happened again, that's less, it's like, yeah, I guess I'm kind of to blame for this. Uh, my fault, my bad. Yeah, my fault, my bad. You're less dissatisfied. If on the other hand it was, hang on, I did nothing wrong, there was no way I could have done anything about this, but you should have seen this coming, and clearly this is going to happen again. Major, the attributions are outside your locus of control, they're not your fault, they are acted upon you, you're going to be very unhappy, and it's going to be a larger failure. So failure can be modified by personal factors. All right, at this point, I'm going to push you back to the text for the discussion around quality and productivity. I want to remind you about the, the philosophical view. Efficiency, customer satisfaction, and effectiveness. A service needs to be effective. It needs to create value. A service needs to be efficient. And you'll see an efficiency argument in here in terms of productivity. And the service needs to satisfy the customer. So if the service doesn't satisfy the customer, it doesn't matter if it's efficient. It won't be effective. And all the quality productivity measures won't work if there's no satisfaction involved. So you're looking to understand satisfaction. One of the things we haven't mentioned for a couple of chapters, but definitely is uh, present here, we are talking about target customers. We're talking back about market segmentation. We're talking about using the toolkit to understand who it is who's buying from you, who it is that you want to be creating a satisfying experience for, and building around there, and building around that core audience and its, and its subsequent audiences. But you don't want to be building a service quality framework for an audience you don't have, nor an audience or also for an audience you don't want. Okay. Dimensions of service quality. I cannot begin to tell you how much fun this one is. Servqual, if you get a copy of the um, Bittner, Zethamol, and Gremler services marketing text that was set for the post for postgrads, this Service quality is the core foundation. Reliability, assurance, tangibility, empathy, responsiveness. The rata scale. On screen is the surf quality scale that this comes from. The rata approach links into the service gap model. And the service gap model we're seeing here, there are two versions of it, so you should be aware of this. There's the four gap and the five gap model. Now, the four gap model is where you talk about it from the marketer's perspective. So gap one is knowing what the customers, not knowing what the customer expects. So that is a failure of information, market research, service design, service blueprinting. Gap two, setting up service standards that don't accurately reflect what the customer expectations are. So that again becomes a case of it's your service planning, your service blueprinting, but also your testing, also listening to your frontline staff. Performances don't match specifications. That is a delivery failure, that's a distribution failure, maybe a product failure, capacity failure. Four, the gaps don't live up to the expectations that are created by the communications, so your IMC and your promotions promise something your service doesn't deliver. Now gap five is actually the expectations perceptions gap. So gap five is often referred to as the customer gap. But these gaps come with control mechanisms. 
And I'm just going to point you to these to look at through the text and use the text for this. But basically, Table 12.2 and the associated chapter parts, you need to be reading this with the service gap model to hand. So this is why I want you to go through this and co-create this, is understanding expectations, setting the right standards, looking at these saying, when I manipulate one, when I change one of the gaps, does it impact on the other gaps? Do I have the possibility of opening a gap? So I'm going to ensure that delivery matches the promise. I'm going to make certain that my IMC and my delivery match up. That could actually create a gap at service quality standard or create a gap at performance. You promise the earth, you're trying to deliver the earth, your service performance suffers. You don't understand what the customer expects, but you're promising them something. You don't, you're promising them something in your communications that you're not aware that you're promising. So your IMC is out there implying that the use of the service will make you a more respected member of the community, but you didn't realize that's how people were interpreting it. So gap one is opening up the more your communications gap uh, enhances and creates this expectation, you also run into other problems. So, this chapter comes with an appendix. Give the appendix a look over. It, see if it is of interest to you. And the other thing is, if you are interested in services marketing and you find that appendix to be fascinating and you're really like, I'd like to do some of this, come and see me. Come and have a chat. If you're interested in doing a major research project around services, we do have honors programs, we do have guided research programs. There is theory, there is statistics, there is calculation, and there's real world impact. So there's stuff you can do with this if you are interested. As always, if you want to connect over the email, on the Twitter account, through the hashtag, or drop on by and make a, an appointment, come see me. And the thing about the customer satisfaction service quality, again, drawing together a lot of the threads, the services gap model is drawing on, here are activities within the service process that we have covered. We've talked about product design and distribution and capacity management and staff training and customer-led standards. This model is about ensuring that we know when and where to tweak our existing knowledge and to apply that knowledge to improve the performance and the perceived performance of our service. Because the most important thing to remember about services marketing is that perception governs, re governs reality. If a customer perceives that it is real to that customer, and if it is real to that customer, that is the parameter we need to work within in order to understand why they are satisfied or not satisfied with the service we've been offering.